the board. Um, I'll just introduce you to Mustafa Bar Baroglu, who is a fellow town meeting member from Precinct 10, but he is also um, going to be joining us along with uh, Jennifer Seuss to talk about uh, possible meeting formats going forward. They were uh, instrumental in a group formed by town meeting last year to research this issue. So we will be having them join us uh, once we get up and running. So Mustafa, we'll, we'll get things up and running. Um, we have a continuance, we just have to vote on, and then we'll quickly dispose of uh, just a, a brief matter with another hearing, and then we'll be on to you. Be um, on mute and camera off, but here, so. Perfect. Be lurking in the background. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. All right. Christian, so one of the, Christian, one of the yep. things that if we don't have anything else going on the 10th, it's it's a long time between now and the next time we meet for, to mm -hmm. approve that the opinion in the case that we have tonight. And I'm sort of wondering whether there's a way of of getting that out of the way without waiting for a whole another month on it. Yeah, I mean, we could certainly meet on the 10th and just have a very, very short meeting. It would take five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right, well, we're at 7.33, so let me go ahead and let everyone in. Oh, goodness, that's a lot of people. Okay, it is 7.34 p.m. It is Tuesday, April 26, 2022. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd call this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present uh, for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont? Here. Patrick Canlin? Here. Kevin Mills? Here. Daniel Riccadelli? Here. Elaine Hoffman? Here. And Venkat Holly? Yes. Wonderful. Good to see you all. On behalf of the town, uh, Rick Ballarelli, our Good board administrator. Good to see you. And uh, Vincent Lee? Here. Fantastic. Good to have you here as well. Um, appearing on behalf of four, and, four to six River Street, um, uh, Dennis Lasco and Wiley Brown? Here. Hello. Good to have you both here. And um, I, I imagine most people are here because of uh, 1820 Belknap Street. Um, so we are, we will be continuing on this hearing this evening. Um, we will not be, we will just be taking a vote to continue. Uh, we will not be hearing any testimony on this issue this evening. Um, it, in our review, uh, it was, discovered that the property actually has a very small portion that abuts the Miniman bikeway. And as such, it is uh, not under the jurisdiction of the Zoning Board of Appeals. It is under the jurisdiction of the Arlington Redevelopment Board uh, for um, environmental design review. And so uh, while we sort that out and deal with the, with the withdrawals and the transfer, uh, we will just be voting to continue on that article this evening or excuse me, that, that case this evening, town meeting tomorrow night. So with that, uh, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures signed into law on February 15th, 2022. This act includes an extension until July 15th, 2022, the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. 
Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please, please be aware that other folks may not may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. So please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted, and the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. In this chair, I reserve to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, and so, uh, because most of the items uh, this evening are of administrative nature, I did want to uh, move us immediately to the first, uh, first to the public hearings. Um, so I'd like to begin this meeting with the public hearings on tonight's agenda. Here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves and themselves and make their presentation to the board. I'll then request members of the board to ask what questions they have. Uh, after the board's questions have been answered, I'll open the meeting for public comment. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. Um, so the I will the first bring up uh, is docket number 3695, uh, which is 1820 Belknap Street. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, oops, we have people in the waiting room. Um, so for 1820 Belknap Street, in, in doing a more thorough review of the, the hearing and the information in front of us, uh, was determined that the there's a very small portion of the property that actually abuts the Minuteman, Minuteman bikeway. And as such, um, it falls under the jurisdiction of the Arlington Redevelopment Board as an environmental design review case. Um, and so we will be just continuing on this this evening. And then uh, the most likely it will need to be withdrawn by the applicant for the Zoning Board of Appeals and then reapplied for under the Redevelopment Board. And so with that, um, are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, I'll take a motion to continue 18 to 20 Belknap Street um, to Tuesday, May 10th, 2022 at 7.30 PM. So moved. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, and um, just as a, as a further note on this case, um, Mr. Dubhan has let me know that um, he has a conflict with uh, the ownership of the property, and so he will not be participating um, in any of the votes on Belknap Street. Okay. So with that, um, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Yeah, aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on Belknap Street until Tuesday, May 10th at 7.30 PM. With that, a move on the agenda, going back to article, uh, to item number 10, which is docket number 3689, uh, 46 River Street. It's a continuance of a prior hearing. Um, and there was new information that was made available uh, and distributed to the board uh, last week in regards to um, the, the roof structure and particularly the structure which extends over the, uh, the front porch at the upper level. And so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Lasko and Mr. Brown. Um, I will uh, I'll let Mr. Brown speak in general. I just wanted to apologize for the confusion that happened with the plans. Um, and I want to reconfirm that the plans the board in front of them have, that the board has in front of them now are the correct plans with the correct square footage. The only change to these plans from the ones that the board was looking at initially um, is the change to the trellis uh, structure that we discussed. The square footage remains the original square footage, which I su submitted with uh, Mr. Valieri's good advice uh, at the beginning of this board process. Thank you so much. Yes, hello, uh, <clears throat> here of the board and ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, <clears throat> I also want to apologize for that mix up. That was a bit of a, 
a snafu. We, we combined them with some earlier version that uh, we had submitted long before, and then there was a bit of a mix up. We, we had lowered the, um, the knee wall to fit the, the zoning requirements. So I'm gonna real quickly show my um, screen just to kind of give everybody a quick, quick reminder. Can you see my screen there? We can. Yep. Okay, great. So again, uh, four to six River Street, um, I think I think uh, I, I probably don't need to go over it too much. We've seen this twice before. So, but here's the context. Uh, the street context is a brick building among a bunch of wood frame buildings, and our intent is to put a 660 square foot or half floor uh, piece on on as a as a kind of a, a second or a second and a half story, and um, and then um, you know combine that as we we've seen here in the rendering from from last week. Here's the existing, and then with this kind of trellis structure, um, we've now submitted this uh, with with the plans and specific dimensions, and um, we look forward to uh, you being able to vote on it. And so uh, nothing has changed uh, based off what we spoke about last week, with the exception of now we've submitted the full set of, of plans for the the preferred uh, proposal as requested. Thank you very much. Um, and so the board is in receipt of those drawings. And, and as Mr. Lasko mentioned, there was a, a bit of confusion on those, but the, the current set that is on the town, on the, uh, the Novus agenda is the, the current and, and accurate set and reflects um, having the appropriate uh, area on the top floor to comply with the town's two and a half story bylaw. Um, and then and just to, to uh, sort of recap for the board, um, this case came before us because it has zero usable open space existing in the rear yard and the addition uh, would require additional uh, usable open space, which is unavailable. And so uh, the board needs to make a determination that, um, that it is not significantly more detrimental uh, uh, so that the applicant can proceed. Are there questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, I will take, um, excuse me, I will take a comment from the public. Um, uh, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Uh, members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Chair will ask those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow others to speak in front of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address and given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, uh, the public comment period will be closed. So with that, um, we have one person with their hand raised, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Just one quick question for the applicant. Um, I know there have been a series of meetings on this and um, um, this visualization is quite helpful in, in the, uh, the ultimate outcome of what you expect it to look like. Um, but I wanted to confirm one thing. I see with all of the, uh, the trellis structure, I think you called it in, in the visualization. Um, the intent is to provide a sort of uh, a deck space, I assume, for the eventual owners uh, or, or inhabitants of the building. And the trellis is a, a bit of an artifice. It's, it's nice. I, I like it. But what the intent isn't to hang or mount anything on any of this trellis structure, right? Um, that, is, that is correct. There's no, it's just uh, anything going. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, the, the trellis structure just kind of adds a little form to the structure and makes it look like a continuous and single plan structure. It might provide a little shade, um, especially closer into the uh, building where the ribs of, are a little closer together. Um, but yeah, for the most part, this is probably not a heavily used deck as we will use our back deck more, but this kind of is a place to come out for a couple of people and talk or, you know, 
take a take some evening air. Uh, uh, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, that's. Uh, I mean, I, I very much like the concept. It's kind of imaginative, and I know that the board was intending. I think there were com positive comments from the board as well. But is there anything to keep the inhabitants or owners from doing what I suggest? And I'm, I'm, when I say suggest, I mean, I'm postulating this might happen. Hanging stuff or, or covering it or making it now an enclosed deck once those ribs are there and the building is built and everything is done five years down the road. So uh, to, to address that question, um... It actually brings us back to town meeting. So there is an article in front of town meeting this year, um, which would require that the enclosure of an open porch requires a special permit. Um, and so hopefully that that will receive favorable action from town meeting um, and therefore would be, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if that was to be proposed, it would need to mm -hmm. come back before town meeting. But currently, if they were to enclose it, it become it shifts from being um, open, you know, from being just open space to being um, enclosed space and part of the gross floor area of the building, and the building would be in violation of the two and a half story, and um, would also not be allowed without uh, further action from the board. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. That helps a lot, and I'm 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 glad to know that the owner of the building will be fully aware of that. And uh, we'll hope for the passage of the article in the town meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? Mr. Hanlon, please. Um, if the, uh, the way in which we normally make sure that, the, that what, we, what is done is what is approved is by uh, comparing it to the drawings. And would, would it, if it, would it be the case that, uh, <clears throat> apart from what you've just described in terms of the violation of the zoning ordinance that would be caused if this was, was brought in, but that that would also be a violation of the final plans and, then, and therefore a violation of condition number one of that usually would be in any uh, special permit that we offer? That would be the case, yes. So I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. So give one last opportunity for public comment and then I'll go ahead and close the public comment period. Okay, so the public comment period for this hearing is closed. Uh, so um, the, the question before the board, uh, so this, as explained at the start, um, this is an existing two-story structure with zero usable open space. They are adding a half story to the top, which requires uh, additional usable open space. But as they have none presently, um, the board needs to make a determination that it is not significantly more detrimental to the neighborhood to have that extension of the existing nonconformity with regard to usable open space. Are there any further questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, I do want to point out that that ordinarily we also apply the special permit uh, conditions of of section three point three point three in addition to the finding of no significant no increased detriment, and I assume that we'll continue to do that. We we may want to re reconsider as time goes on whether that's necessary in cases of this sort, but that has been our practice. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, and bless you, Mr. Mills. Um, so should the board act favorably, there are, th are three standard conditions which we would apply. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There shall be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Condition number two, the building inspector is hereby notified. He is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time is deemed that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints 
If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action, also in accordance with section 3.1. And condition number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, in addition to those three, are there any other conditions which uh, members of the board would wish to consider? Seeing none. Um, may I have a motion in regards to this application? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the application be approved subject to the three standard conditions that the uh, uh, chair has just read into the record. If, if I could add just a second, uh, this is, this is uh, one of those cases that is sort of zero going to a greater degree of zero. And we have always uh, viewed those with a considerable amount of, des of, of deference in, in dealing with them. And that would be the major issue here. The record indicates that we have done a fairly probing inquiry as to the design of the building and whether uh, that was in some way, it would be a violation of the special uh, permit uh, conditions. And uh, I think we've come to the conclusion that with the changes that the applicant has made in the additional plans, uh, that uh, they are consistent with the uh, zoning bylaw. Second. Thank you, Mr. Dupont for the second. And thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so with th that, are there any questions as to what the vote entails? Seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, the motion to approve the special permit for 46 River Street with the three standard conditions is approved. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Have Appreciate a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much. Um, Mr. Chairman, just really yes. quickly, um, <clears throat> besides submitting a building permit set, is there any other kind of formal finishing to this process that I need to do to move um, forward? That, um, if you coordinate with Mr. Valorelli, he'll make sure that everything gets filed correctly. It has to, the decision we so the board will write the formal decision um and when we meet at on may 10th we will vote to approve the final language of the application i mean excuse me of the decision and at that point um mr Va it'll be signed mr valorelli will have it um sent to the town clerk's office to be certified and then there's a 20-day appeal period if anybody wishes to file an appeal at which point the decision becomes final okay Great, appreciate it. Thank you very much to, to you and to the rest of the board for the guidance and uh, and making this a great, great process. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank Have you so much. Um, with that, I'm going to go back to our agenda. Um, so I'm going to take us to item number five, discussion of formats for future meetings. Uh, so we are uh, lucky to be joined by uh, two members of the remote participation study group um, who were founded by town an active town meeting last year to look into um, how boards and other commissions in town could meet um, sort of moving into the, the post-COVID era. And so with us, we have Jennifer Seuss and Mustafa Varglu from that group. So I thank them both for coming um, to speak with us this evening and to tell us uh, what their what their group findings have been. So Mr. Chairman, can I have a point of order? Mr. Hanlon, please. I, I, I wanted to say that so that I could demonstrate that I knew what one was. Um, <laughs> but we have skipped over uh, two, three, and four in our agenda, and I would like to remind us to come back to them in the appropriate time. We absolutely will. Thank you for that, Mr. Hanlon. All right. Good evening. Um, hello. Hello. Um. <laughs> so what we what we agreed on, let me we'll just talk to you. Um uh so there's a couple of things um that we need to talk to you about and um 
it, uh, the situations we're going to talk about are still evolving, frankly, which is why we've been reluctant to come back to the committees to give them more information. Um, so we can fill you in on some of the technological issues and sort of room issues that are, are in town. Um, and Mustafa is going to do that. And then I can talk about sort of the structure of the pilot and what how we see it, it going. Um, unfortunately, uh, we'll, we'll get to this, the room and tech issues um, might sort of take precedence in terms of you know how this looks or whether ZBA can be involved in this. Um, Thank you. Okay. So Mustafa, why don't you talk about that first? Well, let's, I'm not sure, um, just take one big step back. I, I know Christian has been following this pretty closely. I mean, I think I got an email after, I think when our meeting, our very first meeting was announced. <laughs> Christian, a very nice detail. It, it was actually very helpful to lay out the plans. So for the rest of the uh, the ZBA, um, our, our um, study committee was tasked to see, um, it was basically hybrid meetings. So um, a mixture of participants all together in one room, perhaps the ZBA would gather in one space, a few people from the public would be in, in the room with you, and many other people would dial in video conference in, whatever else they would do. So that's just in a very high level, Goal. We're trying to study that, um, and we've done quite a bit of work, which I won't get all in, into the details of it. But um, it's not. It's you know, it's more challenging than remote, and it's more challenging than in, uh, everybody in person. So we're looking for solutions um, and and um, trying to make that possible because we've also heard through some of our work that people are interested in being able to access town, you know, meetings in the town um, from home for a variety of reasons. Health, you know health, child care, time, weather, so on. Um, so, so we're kind of moving forward with this. Um, and so fast forwarding what we um, have done and Jennifer has really been driving this is um, we've done a lot of detailed things, but basically the outcome is that we're proposing a pilot program um, and we are um, looking at survey results that we did of, uh, I think many of you answered that survey of, of the boards and commissions and of the public and um, the ZBA was one of the, um, um, uh, um, sorry, what it appears, boards um, that was um, of higher interest. And we also looked at all the other, a lot of the other meetings that came and we broke them into, um, we sort of categorized them to be, um, you know, you have the select board, which has ACM, ACMI filming it. You have five people sitting in front of microphones, a very formal meeting with a lot of participants. We have at the very other, the far end of it, some um, smaller meetings, generally very little public participation and fewer people. So sitting around a table, the technology there is much simpler. And then we have in between and the ZBA is in that in-between space at the higher end of the in-between. Um, and so the ideal technology that we would picture for the ZBA, which likely um, may or may not be available at the time of the pilot, but will be a challenge to have available at the time of the beginning of the pilot, um, would be two flat panels, a couple of cameras, um, presentation on one video and other people on the other. And then we are looking at um, some technology, I'm not sure if other if people have seen these in their workplaces or other places, something called a neat bar or um, probably at this point a neat bar, which is a camera in the room or a camera that is um, able to take each person's face and put it, even if you're sitting around the table, take your faces and kind of create the grid that we're used to on Zoom as we are now. So even though you are side by side by side, it's not one of those poor video effects of everybody near the front of the table, very large and everybody at the back, tiny. It's each face is roughly equal as we are right now. Um, and so we're looking at that technology. Um, what we're going to do is try that technology in a smaller room. So in that in-between space, um, um, just for, for label sakes, we put the ZBA in the type B type rooms. It's the two big screens, the video and so on. Um, what we are gonna pilot with some initial funds and some initial smaller meetings are um, a type C room, which would be 
a large screen, but a single screen, maybe not as many microphones and something like the neat bar so that when you have people in that room, they are in an array, but we haven't figured out quite, um, or we haven't, we don't want to commit to the technology and the cost of the second screen and the bigger setup for the presentation view and the more complicated microphones. Um, without trying some of this technology at a smaller space and obviously a little more flexibility and lower cost. Um, so I think sort of in a nutshell, I think just to kind of, you know, the, the bottom line message, we would, just with the ZBA's enthusiasm, at least from Christian's letter and, you know, staying in contact with us, we would love to have you as the first wave of piloting, but you, um, we would love if you'd like to try the type C room and see if it works. Um, for the committee, or maybe have a few people from, for, from the board, excuse me, from the ZBA board, take a look and see if you feel it's feasible. But right now, that would be the type of room we could, I think, offer. And that's not, that may not be ideal for this format, or, or you there, may be able to make it work. There, there is another possibility, which is that the select board chambers, um, one of our recommendations to the select board was to use their chambers for other meetings. And um, they agreed to that in principle, of course, there are always logistical time things and figuring out when, whether it works or not. Um, the select board chambers um, are only usable as for hybrid meetings if ACMI is involved. So, you know, traditionally you haven't been filmed by ACMI. ACMI might decide that you're a group that they'd love to add because there's a lot of interest in this committee's work or they may decide that there's interest in the committee's work for some of the meetings. And so that's a possibility. Um, but, but unfortunately in that room right now, without a further investment of technology, which we, we likely are going to recommend, um, they can only be done with ACMI's involvement with a you know, physical person sort of in that closet, right. hanging out, doing things. Yeah, certainly right now, um, you know, Sean Keane from ACMI uh, does record, does record our, hear our hearings and their broadcast, but it's not anything that requires sort of constant supervision. Right, and as I said, I mean, the, you know, I've noticed that it, that um, ZBA meetings have gotten a lot more interest. I mean, you certainly are, um, there are more 40B type of applications. There are more things that the public is really interested in. So, it, so when we talk to ACMI, it might be that they decide, oh yeah, we'd love to do that. But, but again, it would sort of depend on them and they might only do it half the time. Yeah. Okay. We, we had um, um, one committee that we spoke to that said, you know, maybe we don't want to go with this hybrid format. And this so I, we should kind of maybe do some definitions. Right now, remote meetings are allowed until July 15th. We don't know if the legislature will extend those or will be in person. The pilot we're proposing for with a, with the build out of a couple smaller rooms is really gonna kick in. I mean, we're gonna do things all the way to the end of summer, but it'll probably kick in in you know, the September timeframe when a lot of meetings get back to a normal cadence and continue through to um, just before town meeting next year in 2023. Um, so even that's a seven month pilot, it's not a very extensive pilot. So we can, um, I just wanna give some, some frame of reference for, for the timing and, and so on. Um, so what we heard from some other committees is, you know, when there's a very high interest meeting, maybe that would be a time that ACMI would want to, um, it was the park and rec community and they said, you know, anything with a playground, a ton of people show up. Um, those are the kind of meetings that people are engaged in and maybe some higher interest, um, you know, items on your agenda would bring out a bigger crowd. And that might be a time to try that. Of course, you wouldn't want to try it probably for the first time. <laughs> with something like that, but um, but but those you know. So if you even want to pilot it in small doses, you know, not as a you know regular commitment, um, we could learn a lot. You know, our goal is to learn to make a recommendation to the 2023 town meeting of, you know, what it seems to take to get all the various breadth of boards and commissions and committees um, to work, or at least we hope to work. Um, so any information we could gather from you know, anything you'd like to try would still be very helpful, even if it's not a full commitment to every meeting or not possible to do that. 
And I can talk a little bit about the pilot and, and possibly want to, of course, take questions from people. Um, so the pilot, um, as Mustafa mentioned, would start in August or September, depending on both meeting schedules and technology, um, would go for six or seven months. Uh, we would have check-ins at every meeting that are very quick. So a quick Google Doc where we invite members of the public and members of the committee to sort of quickly fill out um, you know, were there any problems? What were the benefits? You know, very quick, you know, less than five minutes type of thing. Um, also not completely required if a member of the committee or a member of the public doesn't want to do it, they don't have to, but it's sort of quick, get quick information. Um, we would then have sort of a longer check-in twice, once in November and once in February, where we would meet with each, each of the committees in the pilot and sort of have a quick discussion, you know, what worked, what didn't, what are you frustrated at, what are you hoping for, you know, that kind of thing, sort of a, a check-in. Um, and uh, so that would be the sort of the structure of the pilot. Uh, before the pilot happens, there's a bunch of stuff that we need to do to provide to each committee. One is that we need to give you really clear instructions on how to use the technology in the room, right? So that's, you know, we, we I need to work with that. Um, two is we're going to offer a series of decision points. So Every committee who's involved in the pilot has a bunch of decisions that they need to make um, about how they're going to run their hybrid meetings. Um, what happens if the technology were to fail? Does the meeting get terminated? Does it, um, you know, get get paused? Does it, you know what sort of that's that's one of our questions. Um, how does the public participate? You know, we want as best as possible for there to be parity between members of the public who are in the room and members of the public who are not in the room, but how does that look? And, it, and variety of committees can make different choices. It can be anything from, we only have 10 minutes at the beginning of a meeting and that is it, the public doesn't participate after that. Other committees are more informal. You know, Any member of the public can sort of raise their hand in this sort of informal discussion and say something. I, I, I don't, you guys are much more formal than that, but I mean, that some committees that works well. Um, so we'd have a series of um, decision points that a committee would have to decide. We'd also have some recommended language that we'd want you to read whenever there are members of the public um, who are hybrid and it would be recommended. So each committee can, can choose to sort of tweak it um, to fit their needs when we're not dictating how committees operate, but we're just sort of providing some tools to help you out. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything. I'm gonna, <laughs> let me just quickly go through. Um, yeah, that's, that is basically, those are basically the stuff that we will, we would, we would provide to the committee. So again, there is this question about whether it's going to work for ZBA during the pilot. Um, but if it does, that's how it, it would look. Thank you so much for that. Um, I had, I had been speaking with, um, with, with both Jennifer and Mustafa about this, um, because, it, you know, the board has been. You know, we've been trying to sort of figure out what works for us um, and that you know we we liked meeting together it was nice you know it was fun being together in the room um, but um, you know in talking with with Pat and with others you know it became sort of apparent that there are certain things that we did when we were meeting together that were not as as open and for the public to view so that you know we would be sitting around a table and somebody would bring out a, a sketch and put it on the table and we would look at it and then certainly nobody else in the hall could see it but we would be discussing it and it would end up being a part of the record um and that that when we were forced to go online all of that sort of went away like everything that people could see anything was all there it, you know from a technology standpoint it took us a little bit of time to get up to speed with novus and making sure that you know all the documents were available and and that side of it but now that we sort of have that handled we sort of hit our stride with with meeting online and so now the you know, with the this looming potential deadline for the state coming up mid-july excuse me it really sort of raises a question as to you know how we want to go forward, which is why I had, you know, sort of put forward the possibility that the, you know, the ZBA might be an interesting case for a pilot study because we, we have recognized there are strengths and weaknesses to the, to the different ways we meet. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be interesting to, to sort of consider how that would work with the board. Right. Right. Um, I mean, if you're interested in the pilot, you can certainly, um, you know, try out the sort of lower level technology that we don't think is ultimately appropriate for you, just to, you know, stress test it, 
you know, does it work? I mean, uh, you know, it, people who join the pilot, if, if something just doesn't work at all, you don't have to stay, right? It's not, we won't insist that, you know, it's totally not working for you, but yeah, you signed up for seven months, so you have to stay, right? But um, I mean, you could, you could try it out. That could be an option for you. Um, we'd want feedback from you, you know, obviously, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stress test um, both protocols and the technology. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon, um, I was wondering, one of the things that is being done tonight, because we're on Zoom, is that we're recording this meeting so that everything you say will last forever. Um, and we will then review that recording, and at least in the public hearings, that will be part of the basis for writing our opinions. And my question is, if we're doing this during the, during the pilot, would it be would that involve our being able to continue to have a recording that could be used to develop minutes and and the various other things that that we need uh, to do during that interim period of time? Because if if we have to go back to the way it was before, which you know we were using it the kind of tape recorder, not video that I, my children used when they were six or seven, and there's no way that an adequate recording can be made with without with that technology uh, and anything that that enables continuing that would be would be valuable for us uh, to to get over to whenever the, the we get past pilots to uh, uh, to to the final solution. I, I can answer that um, at least I can talk about the technology. Um, so if we use a device like a neat bar in the public in the room where everybody's gathered in person and we have this grid like faces and so on that's all on zoom still so the hardware does the fancy stuff with putting you on our faces but behind it is a software that's normal zoom and zoom has the ability to record and and the neat bar also can bring in not the neat bar but zoom and you know zoom in general will bring in the remote people um, those dialing in from their homes or wherever they are um, so you would basically be capturing a Zoom session as you are now, and that so, recording would be there. And that would also then we could share screens and things so that the. That's what we're going to learn. Um, right. Uh, honestly, <laughs> the difference between what we would recommend for you, which is sort of what we're calling the B technology and what's likely to be available initially is the C technology will be an audio. Right. So the B technology, everyone was going to have you know, then an, a device in front of them as well as cameras. Um, with the C technology, there is going to be a device in the room, but it won't be individual. And so in terms of recordings, um, it might be, have some of the problems that a single tape recorder has, you know, in, in that some of the things aren't caught in the same way. You will have the faces speaking, but you'll have to figure out who spoke when and so on. Right, and some people might be more audible than others, depending on where that device is, and depending on the room dynamics, right, where you're located. Um, one of the options for the um, Type C technology is a new new community uh, building, the, the senior center. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great; it's brand new. But the way it's set up is that there is a divider that between rooms. Um, to make a you know to make a meeting smaller, which means that there might be some ambient noise somewhere else, since that might affect audio auditory um, stuff. Uh, the the level B that we're rec we would probably recommend for you is going would be at the community safety building, so an enclosed room with sort of better control over audio auditory stuff. I, I, let me just follow up for a second. The you saw earlier, well, you may have seen earlier, I don't remember when you came in, whether you're here the whole time, but you saw the original hearing. The A bunch of things were put up by the shared screen of the applicant so that everybody is looking at the same thing and can see that. Um, and obviously, that actually is one of the huge benefits of Zoom, because for the reason that the chairman mentioned before, is there an equivalent of that that can be used so that people can all see what the board is seeing and what the applicant is pre is presenting? There should be, because it's a Zoom functionality. Uh, the shared screen is a Zoom functionality. Plus the presenters using that, you know, that, yeah. that on Zoom. Yeah, so so that's, again, the software side of it. Um, 
uh, yeah, so I, I think um, what we're trying to avoid uh, to, to the extent possible is if you've been in sort of some of the older video conferencing where you have a long table, as I said, you know, the first two people take up three quarters of the screen and successively smaller um, all the way back and the audio starts from the front and is lost by the back of the table. So we're trying to find ways around. We think we have technology, at least on the video side, mm -hmm. but without maybe a lot of microphones on a table, we may not have that on the audio side as of yet. Um, right. The presenter could be on a Zoom screen, basically, and share screens in the way you see it now. Yeah. And and might not, it doesn't necessarily need to be in the room because there's no requirement by law yeah. that the presenter be in the room. Um, so one other thing we need to tell you is that the, another thing that's in flux is the state of legislation. So there are a couple of bills, one to um, allow remote participation by committee members, which isn't currently allowed. So after July 15th, the only way for a committee member to be remote is, is under the old rules, which is you're out of town, you're traveling or something else has happening, or there's some medical issue, some medical emergency. Um, there's, there's, you know, Mere convenience is not, according to Doug Heim, our town council, is not sufficient for um, for, for allowing remote transportation. Uh, there is uh, there, so there's a couple of, of, of legislation making its way through um, the state house. I've been assured by Dave Rogers that the final result will look nothing like the current legislation. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of negotiation. Um, it's it's not moving very fast. And so if I just had to wager a guess, I would suspect that we're gonna go back to the old rules starting Ju July 15th, and that the legislator might eventually get their act together next fall. So I, I have a question. So when you say going back to the old rules, you mean the meeting in person? Yes, for committee members. So right. is the impetus for all of this just the fact that the legislation is gonna lapse to allow us to do these remote? Um, Yes, right. That's why we need we can't have an all remote, right? Because all remote's fairly easy. The reason all... that we're looking for hybrid is that that legislation allowing remote participation is lapsing. Yeah. Now you all have to be in the room, but what happens with the public? Do they have an opportunity to meet with you or to hear hear the meeting or, or participate in some way remotely? I because I'd be really curious now that we've been doing this for so long as to whether or not this really would benefit the members of the public? Because honestly, when we were doing 40B, we had so many meetings, our eyes were crossed. And you get to the point where it's like, oh, I've got a meeting tonight. And it's like, you know, you have other things you've got to do in your, you know, your life. So you've got to get to a meeting. And the idea of having to do something like that in the same space, you know, just continuously seems to me to be fairly onerous, you know? And I don't mean to be the Luddite in the room, but it feels to me like this is where we're at. It's like as much as I enjoy meeting with the members of the uh, board, and I do, I mean, it, it feels to me like one of those, if it's not broke, why fix it sort of situations. In, so, in terms of the remote so, meeting? Yeah, or in yeah, terms so of doing the remote and, and maybe there are advantages that would you know come from it ultimately that I'm not aware of. But right now this seems to work. And I guess my real question is at the very heart of this. I mean, we had so many people involved when we were doing 40 Bs. And they, people were just, you know, flooding in. And I am wondering if there's anyone who wouldn't be able to be in attendance at a Zoom meeting and would have to attend a meeting physically. That's sort of something that I'm trying to you know, understand, because I maybe it would be a benefit to have a space where people could go. But ultimately, it just seems to me that the way people do things now is this way. So, um, so it, it won't be allowed after July 15th. Um, so if you want to continue with remote meetings, then that's certainly a possibility the legislature might decide. I urge you to write to your legislators. I mean, that's, we need to put pressure on them. Um, what I think is going to happen is that the old rules will come back screaming. And at that point, the constituents will say, wait, <laughs> you know, and that's when the pressure is going to be on the legislators. Right now, everyone's like, oh, it's fine. Uh -huh. um, so that's why if I was a betting person, I would say nothing's going to happen until after, you know, the session is ending this year, but they can come back and revisit this in the fall. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, may I ask a question? Absolutely, Dan. 
Um, so so uh, if we don't, uh, you know, just uh, thinking about that July 15th uh, deadline uh, where we all go back to the old rules of meeting in person, um, uh, is the is the idea that you know uh, if we sign up for the pilot, we have the opportunity to try the hybrid uh, format at that time, mm -hmm. and then uh, if we don't, it's fully uh, no remote access for uh, for any members who would want to join uh, those meetings. If if you're not in the pilot, you could try on your own to do a hybrid, <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't have access to the the room setups with the technology. Yeah. Frankly, that's what would happen. You could set up a computer in the corner or something. I mean, you could you could try that. And people have done that in the past, but no, I, I you know, it, I think I am echoing what uh, Mr. Dupont just just mentioned. But uh, I think if if uh, we're forced to you know go back uh, due to the legislative implications in person, it feels like uh, we wouldn't want to lose the accessibility of having you know members of the public be able to listen in. Uh, via Zoom with good technology so they can participate. Yeah. May I ask two questions? Um, the first is following up on that. So it's, it seems like we would want to be part of the pilot potentially if we have to go back in person anyway, but there's still a gap in time that we're dealing with if the pilot doesn't start until September. Is that right? Um, that is frankly a technology issue. The technology is being ordered now, so it depends on how long it takes to get here. There's been some reports that there's a, a bigger lag than before because everyone's rushing and then to be set up. So we have the money actually. The money for the initial pilot is coming from a grant that's already been acquired. Okay, so there may, the, it's possible that the only real option in the short term would be fully in person on July 15th until the technology arrives, possibly. Yes, possibly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then my, my other question is going back to hybrid mode, um, just about public comment as, in sort of a hybrid nature where you have some members of the public in person and some remote. I mean, I think I've only been participating while we've been remote, and I think it's it's very easy to establish an order, right? Because it's just the order in which the hands are raised. Um, and I guess I don't quite know how the meat bar works, and if it would be kind of possible to have that same thing happen in a hybrid way. But I, I'm just curious if the topic has come up, if you know, members of the public that are there in person might sort of get precedence over those who are remote or if there's a way of sort of leveling that off? That is a fabulous question. And I will add that to the list of sort of uh, decision points that people have to make. I know, um, you know, many meetings I've been to that are fully in person, there was a sign-up sheet. Um, but as you point out sort of at the moment, you could cover a topic and then at that moment, start seeing hands rise and, and you know that's not quite the same thing as walking into a meeting and signing your name up um so I, I do think we have to come up with um some models of how that looks and those that's a great point one of the things that i think from the surveys and our discussions kind of all around is i think we've recognized that whoever is chairing the meeting so to speak um as that person really won't have the bandwidth or capacity to also manage remote and local or in-person attendees that want to speak. Um, and there will there and, and the technology, if there's any shifting to do around with the technology. So there will be an additional burden on the committees or the boards um, to assign somebody or have somebody to basically carry some of that load, which is a challenge. I mean, this is all part of what the pilot will help us understand. But we we really don't believe that a chair or whoever is running the meeting formally will also be able to manage crowds or people in two different locations. Um, one of the biggest concerns that came up, and, and we agree with this in the surveys, is that everybody wants equal access and everybody should have equal access. So those in person shouldn't have precedence over those remote or, or vice versa. And that's, that's probably going to need to be actively managed in some situations. Um, you know, if, um, so we're, we're figuring that's really the pilot will help address some of these questions um, and like in very broadly across all the meeting, you know, all the all the scale of the, the, the uh, meetings. 
Yeah, so actually one of the things we're stress testing is, can we do this without adding additional personnel? I mean, what the town wants us to come back with is, here's, let's buy some equipment, but don't need to hire anyone, right? <laughs> That's what they would like. <laughs> so um, that may or may not be possible. Um, one of the things that we are stress testing since we don't have extra people right now is to see if, if this can be done. Do you do without stress testing our Rick, our, our, our board administrator by forcing him to, to take all this on? That's right, we're gonna stress <laughs> test Rick. <laughs> Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, this is picking up on Ms. Hoffman's question, which I thought was really terrific. It seems to me that it would be there will be a gap. We we can adjust our summer schedule somewhat, and we used to do that more than we had did last summer when we had the forty <laughs> Bs. Uh, but there will there'll be a gap, and it, it it seems to me that that because of the problems that we've just talked about in terms of being able to you know learn to manage the meeting and manage two rosters and and that sort of thing the quicker we're able to develop experience and ways of doing that the better off we'll be that there'll be a learning curve and uh and it would be nice to be able to to get with it as as soon as possible and 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 establish our chops early on, it seems to me. Absolutely. So is the, the general, so I had sort of volunteered the board to be in the pilot program. I would like to just confirm with everyone that they're okay with, <laughs> with, with that position. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that this board is a good, is a good model for, you know, a board that has some very has various hybrid. We do so many different kinds of things in the course of a meeting that we you know, are in a position to really sort of test out a lot of different different things. Um, and especially because our public participation happens at several points during the meeting, and um, you know, is not it's not something like with the ARB where they you know they often will just have a public comment period that people can speak during. But we actually it's, it's a little bit more of a flow. So. Um, I think a lot could be gained by working on the pilot program. I just want to make sure that the board was comfortable with, with doing that. Yeah, a couple of thumbs up. That looks all good. I, I would agree with you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Great. Well, um, you'll hear more from us. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, the report is being still being finalized. We'll send it to you when it is. And um, Many of us who are sort of working on this are on town meeting. So after town meeting, we're going to in earnest <laughs> go back to sort of working on the um, decision points, protocols, and statements, stuff like that. Okay. So the the next thing we're going to be taking on tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about our, our rules and regulations and sort of procedures and things. Is there anything you think we should keep in mind, or is this something where we really have to wait until this is sort of up and running before we think about how we might want to? sort of incorporate some of this? Um, you know, as I said, we're going to present to you what we think are the decision points. Certainly, um, this will be a give and take. If there's things that you that you know we haven't thought of, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, I, I think I think as of now, it, we're still sort of in this dialogue point, and we'll, we'll, we'll go back and forth on this. Okay. You know, we'll present what we think is sort of the right you know, decisions that need to get made, and then you can come back to us and say whether that works for you or not. Perfect. Yeah. There will be recommendations, and they be, you know, one size won't fit all. So, right. you know, you may pick, you know, seven out of nine recommendations or something like that, or or morph them to fit yourself. So, but I agree, dialogue. I mean, right now it's time to go back and forth. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any other questions from the board? No, I want to thank you both for taking time out, especially between nights of town meeting, to, uh, to join us. Thank you. Um, to bring us up to speed. It's very really appreciated. Okay, good to yeah. see you. Thank, thank you. you for volunteering. Take care. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Night. Thank you. Okay.
So with that, um, I will, going back to our agenda, I will bring up, uh, go back to the top again. Um, so item number two on our agenda was the approval of the decision for 25 Highland Avenue. Uh, so Mr. Hanlon, I don't know if you want to sort of explain some of the challenges you had sort of discovered in, in writing this and how, how we came to the final, the final draft that we have today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to, uh, to provide the background. Um, in the opinion that I circulated earlier, the, earlier today, uh, and encouraged you all to look at the a footnote on page 16, um, is really sort of where it's all kind of concentrated. When we had the hearing in March, it was the third hearing really on this case and the second one that related to the variance issue. Uh, the first one occurred in November. And uh, after that, uh, many of the members of our board left the board and uh, many of the people who are now on the board uh, came afterwards. And uh, the number of people who are currently, who were on the board uh, and who participated in the hearing on um, March 22nd um, omitted two of the people who heard the first hearing, um, Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Ford. Um, Mr. Mills was not at the first hearing, uh, but was a member of the board and is, was capable under Mullen of reviewing the um, reviewing the video of that, and he has done that now and uh, has uh, submitted the certification that that he has done that. Uh, and I'm assuming that his vote tonight will indicate that he either does or doesn't reaffirm what what he voted on um, at that time. Mr. Riccadelli was not on the board at that time, and uh, there's a serious question as whether you can sort of mullen in from the time before you were actually on the board when you would, would, wouldn't have been able to hear, have that hearing at all. But we have a quorum of four uh, under the circumstances and uh, particularly for a denial that should be enough to make a decision. Um, and as, as the board will remember, the decision that we took in March was, was unanimous. So uh, that, was the, that was the hard part. Uh, the reason that came up uh, was that we were under the impression in November that the application had been withdrawn and refiled, which was what we had thought was, was happening in this and some other cases as well. And came when, when I began looking for the documents to put in the record showing that, uh, we, couldn't, we didn't really have the documents to show that, and it's not clear what exactly happened, but we decided that we would proceed in a way that um, that avoided any question emerging about that sort of thing, and that would uh, uh, nevertheless enable us to come to a timely decision. Great. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so that, so with that, the decision, um, the written decision was uh, passed around to the board um, over the weekend for comment. Um, and then as Mr. Hanlon noted, uh, we've made the further further revisions um, today, and that has been uh, recirculated this afternoon to members of the board. So, are there any further questions on the draft decision, or any further comments? Seeing none, um, I'll take a motion um, to approve the decision as written for Twenty Five Highland Avenue. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And we have a Second. Second. Make Mr. DuPont. So then a vote of the uh, of members who were present at both the, uh, the November and the March, um, including the, the Mullen uh, position for Mr. Mills. So Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the decision um, is approved, uh, which is a, a the denial of the uh, request for a variance. Um, and so uh, you'll be, we'll be getting um, 
an email probably tomorrow from Mr. Valerelli looking for signatures, and then that will go ahead and get filed. With that, we go to item number three on our agenda, the approval of the decision for 88 Glenburn Road. Um, so this is a decision I had put together at the end of last week. Uh, it was forwarded around to the board. Uh, comments were incorporated, and that was sent back out um, earlier today in its final version. Are there any additional questions or comments on the decision for 88 Glenburn Road? Seeing none, we'll take a, a motion uh, to approve the decision for 88 Glenburn Road. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the members who voted on the decision uh, at our last session, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And chair votes aye. That decision is approved. Which brings us to item number four on our agenda. Uh, approval of the decision for 18 Brantwood Road. This was put together by uh, Mr. DuPont uh, and circulated for comment. Uh, and then the final draft was released to the board again this afternoon for a final review. Are there any additional questions or comments on the decision for Brantwood? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to approve the decision for 18 Brantwood. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Aye. <laughs> second. Aye. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. And a vote of the members who voted on the original um, hearing. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. The chair votes aye on that decision is approved. So, Mr. Chairman. That, yes, sir. Um, it, as we just took the vote, I realized that the draft, the decision that was approved in 25 Highland has Mr. Rickard Ellis' uh, uh, name in the signature block and on the title page. Uh, and I'd like you, unanimous consent to re remove that uh, uh, since that isn't, that isn't actually the list of people who voted just now. Absolutely. I don't think we need to take a separate vote on that. That is administrative. Um, so this brings us up to, um, so I have, I'm gonna skip around again. Um, so I'll just quickly follow up with uh, item number eight, which is the town meeting update. So um, I had submitted on behalf of the board six warrant articles to town meeting um, in, which dealt with things that we have been coming up with routinely on our, um, as we move forward with our actions. So they were, let's go to my warrant. Um, so it's articles 32 through 37. One dealt with the rules and regulations for the board. So there's a set of rules and regulations that are written into the zoning bylaw. So it's trying to get them out of the zoning bylaw. So we actually control our own rules and regulations. Um, one is a further clarification of the definition of half story, the clarification on the definition of porch and how we're allowed to approve uh, porches within yard setbacks. Um, number 35 is on yard encroachment and that is trying to limit the ability to infill porches without um, a special permit. There's a Number 36 is on large additions and it just sort of clarifies how the, how the bylaw is applied. And then number 37 was on unsafe structures and that just dealt with who can declare a structure unsafe. Um, so those were all put on the consent agenda at town meeting. Uh, the consent agenda allows the town meeting to vote uh, on a whole series of articles at the same time to sort of cut down on time and to uh, remove um, uh, through the time that that's often taken up by discussion and but board uh, members of the of town meeting have the ability to take things off of the consent agenda and so five of the six were taken off the consent agenda <laughs> last night so they will all come up um, in due course in town meeting uh, so it'll pop my guess is it probably won't be until end of uh, you know probably Wednesday of next week is probably the earliest they would come up but um, if anyone was interested in the discussion on those, that they, those five will, uh, five of the six will be heard at town meeting. The one that will not be heard 
uh, is Article 35. Um, that one is, was approved by the consent agenda. So that, that is the one that deals with, um, with yard encroachment and the enclosure of porches. So that one has already been approved. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Mills. You're very optimistic about it's going to be done by <laughs> next Wednesday. <laughs> well, I, I am unable to about attend. Five Wednesdays hence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm unable to attend the session on the 18th. So I'm kind of hoping that things move along enough that that's okay. <laughs> um, so that was item number eight. Um, so I had wanted to I specifically set aside time tonight so we could talk a little bit about uh, sort of the way we do, the way we handle our procedures, uh, both within the committee, within the board, and between the board and inspectional services, uh, and talk a little bit about our rules and regulations and how those work. Um, so I will sort of combine those those two agenda items. We can sort of discuss them together. Um, I had forwarded some documents earlier today, or I guess really late last night, um, which were. Uh, Copies of the, so we have two sets of rules and regulations. One deals with comprehensive permits, which is the, the 40B document. Uh, and then the other is just sort of our regular rules and regulations for everything else we do. Uh, there was also the application packet for a special permit application packet for a variance. And um, there was, uh, I believe I put some draft checklists in, and I may have put in, I can't recall if I put in a draft of a, application for a determination by, uh, um, for an appeal from the decision of the building inspector. So. Um, you, you did. Okay, oh good, okay. So part of the impetus was of this was that we sort of realized um, on uh, the, Lowell, the Lowell Street case that it was very difficult to determine when an appeal to the decision of the building inspector had been filed. Um, and partly that was because there was never really a formal decision put forward from the building inspector. The building inspector just kept saying, you know, we can't, we don't have the documentation to support what you're saying. Um, and the, there's a there's a specific clock that is set in under state law for that you have 100 days from that determination um, for the board to act. And that clock is partly set by the application being sent to the town clerk who stamps it and that sets the formal date. Um, so I'll go ahead. Figure out which one this is. Conference of permits, regulation checklist, show up. This here we go. Application request, no, request special appeal. Here we go. Um, so this, so we sort of, I sort of created this new, um, because there, there currently isn't sort of a, a form for doing it, um, but it sort of includes the, the section, the chapter out of section eight, um, and then put a C in there, and talks about exactly how a little bit about how they need to go about filing it um, and then sort of getting the, the basics of the what's response, what's required. And then I had put in, I had attached the procedure directly to this. Um, and it occurred to me afterwards that I don't know if, if is it helpful to have this as a part of the application? Um, and if so, is this something that we should also try to do for um, our other applications for special permit and for variance. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I, I think A, it, I think it is helpful. Um, I think it's, the reality is, is that people aren't, don't pay much attention to the rules and they know what the usual, their usual practice is uh, before the building inspector, they're comfortable with that. And the, but the result is, is that when things go wrong, as they, as they occasionally do, uh, then we're procedurally in a position where we have to, and sometimes where we have, you know, jurisdictional defaults that can happen because people don't 
pay attention to what they need to know until too late. And it seems to me that it's quite helpful to just have it the original thing that here's a piece of paper, people will review that, they at least get a chance to run their eyes over it and notice that it's there. Um, and I think it's, I, I think it, it is pretty helpful, both in this context, and in, in the other contexts, uh, as well. I mean, for people to begin to comply with state law, starting with their appeals, for example, with something that with a, a document filed with the clerk is it's a major change from the way that people have been doing it and everything that we can do to get the word out that that we're going to be turning square corners here uh, and complying with state law is is something that people are going to have to be trained in. And I think we need to not let any opportunities pass uh, to provide that training to the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So could you go up to the top for me, please? To the top of the form. So um, one, and this applies to the special permit and the variance and then the appeal. So I don't know what we're calling these, but one of my pet peeves is when you call things by different names. So these are all, as far as I understand it, applications. So there's an application for special permit, an application for a variance, and then probably an application for an appeal of the whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it strikes me that in the heading, we call them requests or appeal. And you know, for purposes of clarification, because I know I get hung up reading stuff all the time where I'm thinking where there's an internal reference in the body of whatever form you're reading, and it makes reference to what you're reading, but it uses a different name. It sort of, it always sort of triggers a red flag in my, my mind. I would like to suggest that we have something where it says application for appeal to the permit uh, granting authority, application for special, you know, request for a special permit, or fit it in there somewhere so that they know that this form is in fact the application itself. Very well taken. And then if I may make one other comment, and it's specifically by, I think that they, you know, these sorts of like little sort of, I don't know if you'd call them caveats, but I mean, it's really important for people to understand that their rights in large part depend upon being timely in what they're doing. And I, and I don't know if it's worth having a blurb somewhere and maybe it's, it's too duplicative, but having a blurb somewhere that says, you know, please be advised that, you know, your rights uh, with reference to this appeal are, you know, are dependent upon, you know, following the, you know, the, uh, you know, the timing requirements or whatever you want to call it, you know, strictly, you know, in order to preserve your rights or something like that. And so maybe that's overkill. So, but it just occurred to me that, you know, if we're educating them about what the law is by quoting section 15, is it worth adding something down there saying, you know, you know, don't mess this up. <laughs> you know, you're going to, you're going to lose just, you're going to get timed out. The other thing that occurs to me too, is especially with variances, I don't know. I mean, I always feel like people who come before us for variances, unless it's an attorney or unless it's a contractor, you know, who does these all the time, people just don't understand what it is. Right. And, and I didn't know if, you know, if they're, I forget what in your instructions, maybe you've already got that in there for variances. But again, you know, to stress to people that these are highly technical and dependent upon, you know, following uh, chapter 40, is it 40 or 40A, you know, section 10? And, yeah. and that, you know, that these are very technical requirements and that the board has no discretion you know, as it would in the special permit. This is way too much verbiage, but I mean, I, I'm just wondering what other members of the board think about sort of trying to stress the people, 
you know, it, without saying go get a lawyer, <laughs> which may not be a bad <laughs> idea. Uh, but I don't know if you can direct people to do that, but to tell them that their legal rights are very much dependent upon a very technical right. reading right. of that particular statute. Mr. Chairman, I, I had a, <clears throat> I've been thinking about the same thing and, and actually I'm afraid that, that just lists of points is, are not going to ever really actually solve what Mr. DuPont is raising. Uh, and I think it would be helpful for us, and some other towns have done this actually, it would be helpful for us to develop a, a two or three page document, just going back and, and explaining what a variance is and what it isn't. It's not just a way to do something that makes good sense and you can't figure out it and, and a special permit isn't available. And you know, just to get it across, because we've had cases where people just refuse to believe they they they've read it and they just they fill out the application which we have a form that that quotes directly from the the statute and they just they just don't get it and it seems to me that having something like an instruction form that's separate and that is a little more discursive it gives you more background uh <laughs> that at, at least you've got something out there that somebody could read and say you know uh, I better have a second thought about this. Uh, I would, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Valarelli, um, so when you have these conversations with, with applicants when they first come to inspectional services with these kinds of requests, how, how I guess, how do, how do you currently sort of counsel them on these issues and then do they listen? <laughs> Rick, are you there? Are you listening? Oh, I think we lost Rick. Rick, are you there? He may have stepped away. He may have stepped away. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. I, I think both suggestions of Mr. Hans and Mr. DuPont are excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and something a little bit more <clears throat> informal, descriptive of the process with an admonition that uh, people should read these documents carefully and in order to preserve their rights to appeal for a variance or whatever, they must be very mindful of the details in the timelines outlined in the documents. And I think that would be handy, you know, a sheet that inspectional services can hand out and point out to these people and, you know, with a raised eyebrow, if you don't get it, you may want to get an attorney. Yeah. And, you know, if I may add to build on what Mr. Mills said, you know, you might even be able to have just one sheet of paper. Yeah. You know, where you mm -hmm. say, you know, you say special permit variance appeal in a paragraph, you know, without having to make them go to law school. And, and have them just be able to, you know, read so that they understand sort of the gist of what each of these things is. And each of them would contain the caution, the admonition that you referred to. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I had to step away for a minute, I'm back. Did you have a question for me? We do. So we were, we were talking about, um, you know, putting together a, sort of a, a one or two page guide document for um, people who are considering a filing an application before the Zoning Board of Appeals yeah. that would Thanks. explain okay. to them, you know, sort of what the different, what the different categories are and what's involved. Mm -hmm. And so my, my, my question was, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that you, when applicants come to inspectional services, that you sort of have a conversation with them and run through this. So by, by sort of two part question was one is, you know, sort of what kinds of things do you explain to them? And then the second part was, do they actually listen to you? <laughs> because if we put together a written document that they're just going to blow off, you know, how do we try to avoid that and make sure that they pay attention to it? Well, let me answer the second question first. No. Um, <laughs> the first part, we, we, we take them in. I explain everything to them, what we need, um, and off they go and submit everything uh, when they can. So all, everything that you submitted, I, I looked at everything. I think that is tremendously helpful. I think Pat is absolutely right. Um, if they know the process going forward, we can smooth this thing out. And hopefully, um, 
quite selfishly, it'll be a lot less work for ISD. Yeah. The problem is that they are novices at this, generally speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. Today for River Street, he had an architect, which was fine. Most people try to wing it on their own and it's, it's, it's difficult. Right. Mr. Chairman, I just, if I can just add to that, it, it is even when the applicant is not winging it and the architect is with them, we frequently have people who only occasionally practice that in Arlington and, and they don't, they don't make it their business to refresh themselves as to what our rules are and and we've we've had many many experiences where perfect we're quite competent architects and so on but they just they don't remember or they don't know what a half story is or how we define uh gross floor area or how we apply our you know some of our rules of of usable open space things like that the kinds of things where we're different and and those are people who especially ought to be encouraged to listen because they don't listen in part because they think they know or that if they don't know mr valarelli will tell them and so they 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 get in they can get into hot they can get into deep water faster than they think yeah because i would sort of ask that question to uh, to dan and elaine and venket sort of you know as, as architects, are there towns that, or other jurisdictions you've found that sort of handle this well or that you know, provide better documentation than, than others that we could look to for some examples? I can think of much worse ones, but. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think um, I'm trying to remember, I think I did a project in Cambridge where they had sort of a, a cheat sheet to, uh, uh, the process that was, uh, I think, sort of what uh, Mr. Hanlon was uh, referencing, sort of a uh, explainer uh, about how the process should work uh, with some definitions. And I think to just uh, maybe build on uh, what everyone's been saying, if you go through the zoning bylaws for um, Arlington and you look at the definitions for, say, a variance, it links you to uh, the mass. Um, the Mass General uh, Code and Section 10 with a really long, uh, you know, legal definition, which is, I think, hard to understand uh, if if you're not well versed in that sort of language. So. Maybe having some easier to understand explanation of what a, what the various questions really are. Mr. Chair, um, I, I, I do um, recall seeing a few other zoning regulations and found the architecture zoning regulations here much more um, clearly explained. Like the half story one, at least to me as an architect, probably it, it's very clear the diagram that's shown. More of that kind um, would actually, you know, like an example of how you calculate the open space that is shown. Um, this is very, very clear, you know, very nicely illustrated. So more of those you know, picture speaks thousand words is probably more helpful to, to common folks, I, I feel. Oh, thank you. I think most of those were done by former zoning board member, Steve Revlat, who was now on the ARB. Mr. Chairman, <sighs> what, one of the things to, to follow up on what Mr. Holy just mentioned is um, for some of the time frame things it might be helpful to just do a diagram you know a time series diagram of showing the flow because you know a person's eyes even when you do it really well the person's eyes kind of glaze over in reading a description of an administrative process but it's a lot clearer it can be made a lot clearer as somebody who has a better instinct on drawing than i do but we have architects on this board um, can lay it all uh, can can lay it out in a way that people can take it in at a, at a glance thank you i know there used to be back in the 75 1975 version of the zoning bottle i think they had actual 
flow diagrams using the, the proper uh, computer symbols, symbolism for, for all the different stages and decision-making processes. And that's something we should look into as well. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Can I offer a brief? More, please. Uh, you might want to adopt those flow diagrams, but I would uh, suggest that you stop any adoption of the procedures that went on in 1975 and before. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, were there any other uh, questions, comments, recommendations on the applications? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, two things, actually. One is, I think that we might benefit from putting into our work plan at some point, maybe even at some point when we don't have, when we all have to sit and swelter in a building in, in August when we don't have the pilot program going yet or something. But just encourage, but have a, it's a bit, not quite really a public hearing, but public comment. I'd actually, I mean, there, one, one of the things you want to do is make this process work better. But another thing you want to do is to find out the ways in which our process either are not transparent or are troubling to the people and causing un, un, unreasonable delays and, and so forth. And we don't really hear much. I mean, you know, people usually thank us for our time, which I see which is usually what they do when they lose, I suppose. But the, the thing is, is that if we're doing things that are really problematic for people, uh, we don't always know that uh, because we, we, we're not in a position to monitor it. And I just think that having, a, having some ideas out there and, and getting ideas from, the, from people who appear before us, either occasionally and so forth, might be a helpful thing to do. It, it might be a helpful thing to do like many businesses do and, and just have a, uh, you know, how was your experience and have uh, five questions that give us some feedback on what's going on. Because uh, we'd like to make, I mean, we can't, we can't give people everything they want, but we could at least give them a good process. And we don't always know enough about how to do that. Um, and um, that was the first thing. The second thing I wanted to say is that when we look at the checklists, one of the exercises I think that we should be going through ourselves is figuring out how it is that where it is that people get things wrong. Uh, I mean, sometimes because you want to avoid later on the, well, you, you purport to have a calculation of the half story, but actually you can't, your, your paper doesn't show that. Uh, and it needs to show that. And somewhere there's got to be some place which says we really, really mean it. And uh, so figuring out where the choke points are, where people go astray and that causes delay right later on so that we can front load and encourage people and underline that you think that you can get away with doing something, but you can't, uh, would, be, would be helpful in expediting things and avoiding the delays later on that, you know, sometimes can kick you over for a month or six weeks when it, when it really is a small thing that 10 seconds could have figured out or at least 20 minutes in doing the papers. That's a good transition to thinking about the, about the checklists. So we, I had started putting these together, good gosh, two and a half years ago now. Um, we've never sort of formally adopted them, but we've sort of looked, in, looked into doing them a couple of times as to, so some of the documentation that's listed here is specifically called out in the rules and regulations as to things that people are supposed to be applying. Um, and I'm sure as, as Rick can tell you, a lot of these, you know, people don't provide these things um, and it would be, very helpful to in special services to have you know checklists that you know they can put in front of somebody and say you know until you can check off all these boxes I can't accept your application um, because 
a lot of a lot of the problems that um, the things that eat up Rick's time and eat up in special services time are people who come back time and time again and still don't have the documentation together. And we sort of end up, you know, in situations where somebody, you know, comes before us and real, you know, as you know, as Pat said, and, and just don't have what they need to have for us to really be able to make a, a real decision. Um, so to, to the point that, that Pat was making before, are there things that we, are there specific things that we think we should be requesting that we're, that maybe are not, we're being requested now, but also are there better ways for us to ask for things that would, you know, probably elicit a better response? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Mills. I think one item we could put on there is a checklist for a, a tree plan completed. We often ask that Mr. Moore's requesting that. And if it's done a priori, we don't have to worry about it. Rick, what are some of the things that you notice that are most commonly missing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I reviewed this. I, I thought it, it looked great. The only question I had was, uh, should we put that the applicant has to take the complete package to the town clerk and have it stamped? Good. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So that raises actually a larger legal issue because the uh, notwithstanding the practice that we do now legally, an application for a special permit is filed with the town clerk first. Um, and so if somebody is strictly following the procedure required by state law, they're coming to Rick after they filed something with the clerk. And we need to figure, I mean, and I guess I don't really, logically you would be able to say, well, that you're the timing tolls until you have something that meets the regulations for a, a filing. But we'd have to figure out how that, and legally how that can be done. Uh, but it's very useful because what you want, I mean, the, the best way to get someone to focus is if Rick looks at, this stuff and says here's the checklist here's what you did you didn't do enough your time isn't running i'm not scheduling anything you're not gonna nothing is going to be granted by operation of law your application isn't really complete until we say it's complete and i'm not saying it's complete until you filled in everything and i'm satisfied that you filled it in and in the way that's really called for and so yeah i think that you would need to start with the I mean, everything starts with that stamp paper from the clerk, but then you need to be able to have a fairly definite process so that you know when it's complete from Rick's point of view and from our point of view. And that's when, and up until that time, I hope the law is that that the timing will toll right. uh, for constructive approvals. Yeah, so you... uh, Mr. Chairman, can I comment on that? Yes, please. That, that, that's a great observation. So it's a little bit of a conundrum. So before I get the complete package, it's supposed to be stamped by the town clerk. The, the packages are never complete. There's always something missing. So if it's stamped at the town clerk, then it's submitted to me and stuff is missing. It also tells me somewhere that... Um, the uh, clock does not start until the package is complete. Then uh, it's telling us somewhere else that the clock is starting once it's stamped at the clerk's office. Do you think that I can, uh, we, the applicant can stamp it at the clerk? Um, really, he should come to me first. But anyway, let's say he doesn't. He can stamp it at the clerk, come to me, and then we can kind of backfill the missing pieces as the clock is ticking, I, I think that's doable. What are your thoughts on that? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Could I just, it seems to me that there are two things that are going on. One is 
sometimes there are things that have to get fixed when the clock is ticking like the additional information we had in in the river street case yes. is something that emerged in the hearing and you can't just sort of say no we're not going to listen to anything anymore but some of the things are things which the stock clock shouldn't start ticking until as as long as those things are incomplete and that's i think what we've been talking about the things that that if you don't have everything on the checklist in appropriate form then then your your clock shouldn't be ticking during that period of time so there needs to be some sort of a certification when that period stops that you know rick has to sign something or give a receipt saying that this is that 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 the application is complete and i looked at bombrowski Bobrowski, who's supposed to have the bible and like a lot of things in the bible it's sometimes subject to interpretation and uh he suggests that if you don't have a complete application you're running the risk that your time is not going to be running uh but he doesn't really just he doesn't cite anything or or explain any about how that actually works uh and i think it's kind of fundamental and we may not need to work with mr heim on structuring this and giving everybody notice that the time doesn't really begin until they've actually full, met the requirements of the regulations for something filed with the board, I guess. I mean, I, mm -hmm. may, we should be involving Mr. Heim, you know, beginning to end to figure out exactly the way to turn square corners here. But in principle, we need to start off with the town clerk, and but the town time really shouldn't start running until Rick is certified that there's a complete application. And maybe we could include on the, you know, sort of on the bottom of the checklist, just a, you know, a place where, you know, the building inspector can sign off saying the application is complete and ready for submittal to the. Yeah, the that's board. a possibility too. Because remember, Rick does sign, he does sign some of the papers, right? The, I mean, some of them of the forms have that that's been reviewed by the building inspector and Rick will ha have his name there and a date. Um, but that's only particular papers and there are many more papers that are here mm -hmm. than he actually signed. So ultimately, you want to have some sort of certification of completeness that mm -hmm. deals with the entire checklist and not just one any particular document on it. We need like a meta checklist for all the different forms, and then you can sign off on the bottom of that one. Almost. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you raise a good point. If they, if they um, bring the package into us, uh, we can say, OK, it's ready now to be stamped at the town clerk. It's, it's only beneficial to them, really. Yeah, right. Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? Please, Mr. Moore. Um, why is it required that the town clerk stamps something when someone presents it to them? Because why could the town clerk not be willing to stamp it until Mr. Valerelli's signature is on it? Unless that's a matter of law, I don't know. Just tell the town clerk not to stamp it until Mr. Valerelli has signed something. He won't do that unless it's complete. I had thought the same thing, and I think that that's a question for Doug Heim. Okay but I think it's a good idea because it strikes me that the first stop, isn't it right, Rick, that the first stop is that people come to you. That's correct, Roger. And so if they're coming to you in the first place, I mean, you know, it, 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 like, you know, everyone said it's to their benefit. If, if you say, look, you've got to do all of this before you can, you know, really bring it to get it stamped. Although that may not technically legally be true as Mr. Moore has just sort of asked the question. But it strikes me that, you know, there's no impediment for sure in you being the first person to comment on it. And I suppose if ultimately we could say, you know, to the town clerk, you can't sign off on this until, until you get or stamp it until, you know, we have our signature on it. I mean, that would just make 100% sense. I, I think you're absolutely right. And the chair has presented a very reasonable list of our requirements uh, prior to filing. I mean, we need this stuff. Yeah. Uh, we need this uh, stuff for the board to make a reasonable decision. And um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think that ISD should say, okay, it's all right now to take to the clerk and get it stamped and then the clock starts. We should, we should recognize, Mr. Chairman, that it's not really just stamping it. It's the actual filing is with the clerk, just as right. in, in a court, you're filing with the clerk of courts and she's keeping the record so forth. And, and that will be that will be critical. Um, and I, I mean, I, I agree that it's a question, Mr. Heim, exactly how to structure it. But what makes sense is easier to figure out than what we can get of what we can do sometimes. Mr. Chairman, one other question. Um, I didn't see the bottom of the form. And oh. I don't know, is there a line for other? Because I don't know, Rick, if there's ever an instance where, you know, there's something in addition to all of these things that you might say, well, you know, for your particular case, I'd like you to do this or that. And I don't know if that's something that you'd even need to consider, but. Um, well, I think Mr. Mills raised a great point about the tree warden signing off, or at least that they need to touch base with him. And if they're, if, if it's not applicable, uh, then fine, but at least he signs off on it. And what I raised with the chair before, um, you know, ISD approval, then um, the applicant is to take the application package to the town clerk and, and have uh, two copies, uh, time date stamped, uh, return one to ISD and leave one with the clerk. Right now we're doing that. ISD is doing that. Once we feel the package is complete, um, we have not always done this in the past, but since we are trying to get things right, I think that the board will notice that the uh, newer applications have been stamped uh, right. with the town clerk, but ISD is, is taking uh, the applications to the town clerk. So, uh, Mr. DuPont, to answer your question, if we could get some language in this explaining to the applicant basically that ISD is to sign off, that the application is complete and worthy, for lack of a better term, uh, to be taken to the clerk to be stamped, as well as the uh, tree warden signature. Good. Other than that, it's 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 absolutely it's perfect, really. Good, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Can I ask this sort of shifting away from the process? One of the things that we've been in a recent conversation about, uh, I think, with Mr. Valarelli, uh, is that we don't have contours on plans, and that sometimes you need that. And when I look through the site plan here and the proposed site plan, um, there's nothing that is clear to me at least, or that would be clear to just about anybody that what you need is, is to have a contour, you know, contours drawn on, onto the plans. And I was wondering, A, if, if I'm right in remembering that that should be on the plans on a routine basis, and B, if, if not, whether we think that it's important to, to say it out specifically for fear that people won't say landscape feature may, may to some people mean that, but not necessarily everybody. Can I answer that, Mr. Chairman? Please. Uh, Mr. Hamlin, absolutely. So I don't have the bylaw in front of me, but um, open space is a great example. 75% uh, of the open space cannot have a slope greater than 8%. So I need a contour to um, make that calculation. Uh, I, I always ask for contour if I'm unsure of the uh, terrain, especially, but I always ask for uh, topos. Okay. It's not only usable open space, but that's how we determine the height of a building. No, oh, sure. Yeah. Right. So it seems to me that on a checklist, we need to be explicit about that. So that so ideally somebody should know what he needs to do reading the checklist, even before they've had a conversation with Mr. Valerelli. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate Mr. Mills' uh, input on that, the, the two checkbox. Yeah, one way to make um, the appreciation for tree concerns is to have it appear in multiple places. And this would be an excellent one since so that comes up a lot. Um, so, so, so thank you for that suggestion. Um, can I make one more suggestion? Um, one of the things I've noticed through the many meetings that I've sat through is that 
you have to do a lot of continuances because as you folks have pointed out, the packages are not always complete or you have some questions that do come up during the meeting, which were not considered by the applicant, which makes complete sense. But oftentimes the figures on documents are wrong. They're badly calculated. They didn't follow the regulation for open space or the half story issue or that kind of thing. I think it might make sense for you to incentivize good behavior, meaning that if a package comes forward and has bad figures, whatever, you don't offer that person to continue at your next meeting. You say, all right, two months delay and make some pain back on the applicant for not having been a little more uh, careful in putting a package together. Thank you for that. I, I know it sounds a little punitive and I'm not sure that is the way you wanna go. That's, this is not it's your board, but it would definitely uh, engender better behavior yeah, putting these together by not not letting someone come back two weeks later or four weeks later say, no, if you mess this up, it's a two or three month delay for you. Do you really want to do that? Or are you going to try harder to get it right the first time? Kind of thing? Anyway, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'll shut up now. Mr. Hanlon. <laughs> I, I, you know, in, in, in the ideal world, we wouldn't even need that. But the the fact of the matter is, is that some that there's such a variety of people who are coming before us. Some, you know, are just when you saw it, they just they put arbitrary numbers there, and you can tell that. I mean, they have the same number for proposed and and present, and you know that can't be true, and that sort of thing. Um, and so they're just scoffing at it and figuring out this is not serious. And as long as I fill in, the, and sometimes they don't even bother to fill in fill it all in. For other people, they just didn't get it, or they didn't understand, or they didn't understand the technical aspect of the, of how you make the calculation, or they're used to it, and and sometimes that's just an ordinary person looking for a dormer, and he's doing it all himself, and he's totally, or she is totally, intimidated by how hard all of this is, and sometimes it's people who ought to know better, and they're they're just it's it's really hard to have a one size fits all sort of response to having those things having those things wrong uh, and i you know i'm really sympathetic with the with the ordinary person who's coming in a dormer who doesn't spend a lot of time appearing before committees it's a to us it's not a scary process usually although some 40b's it's a scary process to come to a meeting but you know, to lots of people, this is not the, what this, this is the world they live in, and and uh, I, I, I I I'm a little bit reluctant to to be too punitive. I, I'd much I'd much rather have a gatekeeper in the beginning that would warn them when they've got it wrong, than than for the board in its initial hearing to be the gatekeeper, and then to and then to put them in the line depending upon what we what we think of them I, mr chairman mr mills yeah following up on uh, mr moore's suggestion and pat's suggestion you know it really does seem there are two pools those that are innocently making mistakes and those that are cavalierly ignoring the rules and i think it's usually fairly easy to, to discriminate those two groups mm -hmm. i would say on our cover sheet where we describe the various um materials and types of permits that something on the bottom says you you need to pay attention to the timelines you also need to pay attention to filling out the forms correctly failure to fill out the forms correctly could re could result in significant delay if you have questions please consult uh with that cons you, know, you could good. be consult inspectional services to make yeah. sure your forms are complete and you know, the, then if somebody comes back and just you know is putting bozo numbers in and ignoring us, oh, fine, yeah. too much. See you later. But somebody's you know, honestly making a mistake and doesn't understand. Okay, we can help them out, and I'll see you in two weeks. Right. I I get insulted when people insult our time. My time is valuable. When people waste ours, I think they should pay a price. Yeah, I, I like the idea of. Being Sort of including it sort of in that cover letter we were discussing yeah, earlier. It's an or gate, you know, you don't have to do it to everybody, but if someone's, you know, dissing mm -hmm. us, well, 
Yeah, I mean, because the other side of that we have to pay attention to also is just the you know the the statutory time limits we have for action on things. That if we that's true too. You know, we don't want to get we don't want to put ourselves in a bind. No. And for God's sake, leave enough time to write the opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there anything else on checklists that we wanted to discuss? There anyone would like to discuss? No, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I I had just uh, had a question because I think I had uh, texted you. I am going to have to leave here at nine forty-five, and I believe we have a vote coming up. Yes. And I didn't know if we might be able to get to that sooner rather than later. We could certainly do that now if we're going to be running the risk of losing people. Um, oh, yes. So with that, I will go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead. I'll table this discussion for the moment um, and move on to item number nine, uh, which is the election of officers. Um, so this is so. The board has two officers. We have a chair, um, which is the position I hold, and we have a vice chair, which is the position Mr. Hanlon holds. Uh, these are annual positions, um, and so we they sometimes have been longer than a year, sometimes shorter than a year. But I'm trying to like, trying to make them annual um, in, in April. So uh, we would so we need to vote on a chair and a vice chair, um, and. So so I think the procedure we have used in the past is I will accept nominations uh, first for the position of chair. Are there any nominations? I would like to nominate uh, the present chair, Mr. Klein, for the position of chair. Second. Thank you very much for your vote of confidence. I will accept that nomination. Are there other nominations for the position of chair? Seeing none, um, I will take a vote of the board. Uh, voting cheat sheet. a uh, so vote of the, this, so this would be a motion to, um, uh, I guess elect uh, Christian Klein as chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for a period of a, of a year. Um, and so uh, because we're meeting online, we have to do votes by roll call. So Mr. DuPont. Uh, aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Fidelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Chair folks. I uh, thank you all very much for your vote of confidence. Um, then the, our other, our next position is the uh, position of vice chair. Um, so I will accept nominations uh, for that position. Mr. Chairman, I would like to nominate Patrick Hanlon as vice chair. Go a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Are there other nominees for the position of vice chair? Seeing none and following this, the same procedure, um, we do a roll call vote of the board for approval of uh, Mr. Hanlon as the vice chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the period of one year. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Grigardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Congratulations to Mr. Hanlon being reelected by chair. The chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you both very much. Absolutely. Um, so these positions don't need to be permanent in, in any stretch. So, you know, uh, you know, think around uh, New Year, start thinking about, you know, if, if other people would like to, to take on um, some leadership on, on this board. That is. You know, it would always be a great thing, but I have greatly enjoyed my time as chair. Um, it has been been a challenge um, getting thrown into it uh, rather unexpectedly one evening. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know the story behind it, our 
past chair um, was indicted on federal embezzlement charges, and uh, we needed to change now. chairs on very short notice, uh, right at the start of the 40B hearings for Thorndike Place. And so that, uh, that's sort of how that came about. And but I, I, I think the board has been doing, the board has done tremendous work um, over the past two years. And um, I really appreciate the, the level of professionalism that, that Mr. Hanlon has brought to the, to the decision-making process, the decision writing process, um, and our continual work to try to make this board more accessible to the public and to make our processes clearer and more succinct. Um, I think it's, it's been really great. So I appreciate everyone's efforts and uh, look forward to this serving as your chair. Mr. Chair, can I add a comment? Please, Mr. Moore. Um, you've heard me say it before. You folks work very hard and um, it's one of the boards that doesn't always get a lot of appreciation because there's contention between you and the applicants regularly. Most of it's civil, sometimes it's not. And you guys work very hard. And, and um, I just want to say that I, as a uh, casual but regular observer, have noted that directly. And I think um, it's one of the very important functions of town that you do. Um, it's too bad that folks like you don't get appreciated more. And uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, it's clear now how you need to exit when you've had enough. Uh, the example was provided. <laughs> <laughs> you always have your escape clause, sir. Yeah, escape clause. <laughs> no, unfortunately, that, that has moved on to sentencing phase now. So <laughs> <laughs> I wish to, wish to avoid that portion of it. Just hope your sister likes you. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, so thank you, thank you, Mr. Dupont, for for asking us to move this forward. I know you you have a commitment this evening, so thank you for that. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I would like to return uh, just to rules and regulations. I'm not going to touch the comprehensive permits stuff right now, uh, but those of you who did serve through the the 40 Bs, if you wouldn't mind taking a look through those and see if there's anything in there that you think might need need some uh, some reconsideration, that would be great. Um, on our regular rules and regulations, I, in parallel with some work we had done on the town zoning bylaws, um, I do need to go through and um, make sure that the document's gender neutral because that was not done in the past. Uh, and I have a note in here that um, under the application process, we need to add that the, the, that the submissions need to be filed with the town clerk. Um, and so that is something we need to add. Um, we don't mention the design guidelines in our- I was thinking about that. Yes, that, that might be a checklist thing too, actually. Just, just to certify a certification that you've read and some sort of thing, and not, not that you've followed them, but that you've just paid attention to them. You've reviewed. Yeah. Good idea, Pat. Mr. Chairman, I got a couple of comments on the comprehensive permit regulations. Yes. On page two in definitions, it describes local boards and gives a whole list. Yes. <clears throat> and following my previous theme, you might want to include the tree warden. So we, should it be the so page two, item 2.0 definitions, okay. local boards? Well, I, I think I would, I would look to Mr. Moore, should this, so this is basically our comprehensive permit rules. This is a list of sort of under the generic term of local board, what boards might be included. And I'm wondering if it makes more sense to reference the tree warden or the tree committee. Uh, I would ask Mr. Chairman what you're looking for the board to do for the applicant in this case. It's just, we, the, so the, the applicant, it would, it's typically it's things like the, you know, the applicant needs to, or let's see. That's a good question as to what exactly it says. 
um, we'll be obligated to provide to notice to them. Then yeah, they will have the opportunity, but not the obligation to provide comments to us. But beyond that, we need to do a, a text search for the word local board to find out where else it comes up. But it's, it's typically it's that the for comprehensive permits, obviously all the decision making rests with the zoning board of appeals. So the board of appeals is looking for recommendations and guidance from local boards. And I think that the question is who should the zoning board be reaching out to? Um, my, ooh, that, that is a difficult one because I know that I've been providing you input on 40B issues for the past year or two, um, but I'm not doing it, you know, because I'm an ex officio, I'm doing it because I'm just a member of the public. Um, the tree warden offers guidance on following the rules in terms of trees, taking down trees, what the setbacks are, things like that. Okay. The, the tree committee, of which I'm a member, is a little more involved with a policy, making sure the tree bylaws are current and being followed, and if they're not, how to fix them, uh, encouraging tree canopy in town. So I'm not sure the tree committee would necessarily be the group. It depends, on, <laughs> it depends on what sort of guidance the applicant is looking for. The tree warden is the one mostly behind the rules, if that's what you're looking right. to offer the applicants. Okay. I would vote for tree warden because you're looking for compliance with regulation. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I, think, I think you're right. I think the tree warden is the way to go, vice the tree committee, because, yeah. Three committees more policy. So, okay. Yeah. And the list is definitely a mix of both boards and committees, but also departments and um, sort of departments of one. So, uh, next item on page three. Yes. Um, at 3.2.5.4, there's a reference to trees uh, with a 24. DBH, which is diameter of breast height. That sounds like a really big tree to be the minimum one you're going to consider. I'm thinking the tree committee may want to weigh in with a different number on that. Or the tree. The whole, could you read the whole phrase, Mr. Mills? Um, no, I don't have it in front of me right now. I did read the whole phrase. So basically, what it's, it's talking about a set of preliminary site development plans and it said said plan shall include the following information and then among those is existing significant environmental features such as ledge outcrops scenic views um, and trees i.e greater okay. than 24 inches dbh yeah it, it, mr mills your point's very well taken in in my opinion because the bylaw goes down to eight inches, I think it's eight inches currently, and we're talking about changing the- I was thinking right. that would be appropriate. I mean, I got a massive oak in my backyard that's not 24 dBA. Yeah, yeah. no, it's an excellent point. Um, I, I, Do you need any action from the tree committee on that? I, the, so I know that there's a, a Warren article before town meeting this year. Is that yeah. to reduce it to eight or is that to go from eight to six? Eight to six. Eight to six. Um, but, ooh. Uh, this is this is for a 40B project we're talking about. Yeah. Six inches is pretty small 40B size lot usually. Uh, well, it, to be consistent with the town, right now you go with eight because that's okay. the town. So I would say until the law changes, until the bylaw changes, you should stay with that, in my humble opinion. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Good catch, Mr. Mills. Hey, when you're retired, you got time. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got for us, Mr. Mills? Um, a minor formatting thing on page four, 3.2.13. It refers to a uh, professional wetland scientist. And it's all in lowercase, but then it puts uppercase PWS. Ah. When you're going to do something like that, the, the profession, the PWS should be capitalized in the name. If you're going to use the acronym afterwards, just yep. a formatting. Yeah. On page five, three point two point uh, one six, uh, we should put in something about the residential design guidelines should be included. Oh. 
Okay. And on page nine, there's a list of maximum things. And again, you should, um, a reference to adhering <clears throat> to the reg residential design guidelines. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. It might be better to put, since the residential design guidelines are not compulsory, uh, it might be better to put in something like a statement of review or a statement of how this does or doesn't uh, uh, comply with the residential design guidelines so that it, it's information to the board rather than something that purportedly has a regulatory impact. Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I think that we are going to need to do uh, at, at in when we get into the, the these in, in more detail, um, but you'll remember that we we sort of ignored these rules uh, after a beginning because because essentially we started off with the applicant gave us what the applicant wanted to do. And then, you know, theoretically, at least over the course of many months, they filled in the rest of it, sort of. And we were put in a position where we, we, we were either going to have a procedural argument at the beginning about whether or not they comply with the procedure, and then what were we going to do about it, and the time was ticking. Or uh, we were going to have to get on with the business of processing the application, in which case what we were asked to do at the end of the whole process is waive compliance with our guidelines. So the effect was to not have an effect. Um, and it seems to me that if we want to make these work for us, we need to simplify them and to provide a way of accommodating the sort of iterative process that actually happens, while at the same time, when we really absolutely need something, or want something because for you know there there's obviously there's lots of things in here that we don't that just produce useless verbiage and other things that produce information that we really need to have to move forward and the current guidelines don't really distinguish between those things yeah. and we'd be a lot better off if we were able to have something that you know aimed at the stuff we needed to know and maybe avoided having a 20 pages of how it is that what they're doing complies with the comprehensive plan, which ultimately turns out to be a selling job that costs the applicant a thousand dollars for the lawyer and, and that we don't, I, I suppose we did read it, but we certainly didn't remember it. Okay, so is it, do you think it's more sort of setting us sort of like you know, not not necessarily, but like bifurcating what we're requesting between things that we that are more and less important, or is it more sort of coming up with a way to encourage greater right. compliance? I, the key thing is was timing, right? I mean, the the way these are written, all of the stuff has to be filed the first day. Um, so some of those things are are not that important, and the applicant we could just say the applicant can if they want to i mean you know compliance with the comprehensive plan is like that that just gives rise to a selling document and you know i don't know that we need to be pushing anything particular about that but some things we really need to have the first day and some things we need to have over the course of the proceeding and sometimes we need to have this information at some point and at some point we would welcome the information but it's up to the applicant whether to provide it and we ought to be able to make those two discriminations, which gives rise to a four cell chart as to where the stuff all goes. Mm. Okay. Yeah, because it sounds like something that we would want to try to handle and it's, you know, some kind of a, a pre-start conference with the applicant as to yes. what we absolutely need now. Actually, that would be a terrific idea. I mean, it's sort of like in a court where you, you have certain things that are filed, but then you have sort of a pre, a pre-style conference that helps that describes how when when it is that th certain things are going to be done. 
And, and part of what we did really in both of the cases we had was a period, periodic meetings that talked about what was going to be done like for the next hearing and so forth, just the way a, a judge would do before he has a hearing and or she has a hearing. And uh, it seems to me we should do that. But anyway, the point, of, the point is to try to figure out some way of structuring both the filing and the process to make it actually work for us and make it useful as opposed to something that we just ignore and then forgive at the end. Well taken, thank you. Anything else on rules and regulations? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanley. Um I was just, I'm assuming that this won't be the only time we have to look at that. I was looking at our regular rules and regulations and I'm beginning to have the feeling that I'm, I'm not 100% sure we really need to review those against the state state law. And it's not completely clear to me where these, I wasn't here when, I guess I was here, but I, the, for example, on the, on 1.2.1, 1. um, the second sentence at least is taken from the statute but parts of it of the statute are omitted, like people who are challenging uh, a, a uh, uh, enforcement. Uh, and there's no real provision in here for the, the state provides for abutter appeals and our rules don't seem to be contemplating the abutter appeals. And I'm just, I just, I, I saw that and began thinking, boy, when the time comes, we really need to compare our rules against the requirements of state law and be sure that we, that both that they're the same when there's a state law requirement and to make sure that there aren't categories of things like refusal to enforce mm -hmm. uh, that are in the state law. And I know there's an issue at town meeting about some other thing, which is it's difficult. But the thing is, is that whatever is in state law, we should be envisioning as something that we do and providing and providing guidance uh, uh, for it. Now, it's clear to me that somebody decided to take that out mm -hmm. uh, because they're quoting the statute and then suddenly they, they, they certain language that's in the statute doesn't appear. But I do think that that's an exercise we need to go through is to read this against the statute and make sure that we are not jumping over things that we shouldn't jump over. Okay. Well, as Mr. Dupont had to leave early, we could assign that to him. <laughs> as a matter of fact, because he left early, we could assign it to him. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. I was just reading the rules and regulations and a lot of the numbering I found quite confusing. Okay. You know, like you have a 2.21, 2.22, 2.24, but there's a not a 2.23. Huh. And then you could read up and down. I, I had a hard time following the indentation. Okay. In the sequencing. Minor, minor issue. Yeah. And I have no problem with the text. Yeah, some attention ought to be paid to, I mean, there's only so far you go with the plain language rules, but making these things, um, you know, more intelligible and, and having a numbering system that's transparent and that easily leads you through it is is helpful. Yeah. Using typeface, using, you know, there's there are lots of things that people who are good at this. And I think that the town actually employs people who are good at this mm. uh, to to just make it more more user friendly by making it better by making the physical presentation work better. This was obviously written by a lawyer or under the influence of a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Very good suggestion, Patrick. A lawyer under the influence? Is that <laughs> <laughs> a lawyer under the That's good. <laughs> All right. So for, um, for next steps then, 
Um, this I have lots of little comments. Um, I would I can take a look into the applications. Would somebody be willing to take a stab at a um, sort of a cover letter? Sure, I can do that. Well, wait, I'm getting a little bit unclear what the cover letter was. If it's sort of as the set of instructions that I suggested earlier on, that's fine. If it's something that requires Mr. Valorelli's knowledge, I'm unsuited for the task. No, no, it would, it's sort of an ex, ex, the explanatory document that would go on the front that would sort of explain the difference between the three processes yeah. and. No, I could undertake to do that. Great. Um, would that include what uh, what Kevin was sort of talking about in terms of sort of you know emphasizing that incomplete forms can lead to significant yeah. delays? Would that be a part of that yeah, as well? It would. Okay. Uh, Those are the ones that can sort of easily parse out at the moment, um, but I will go through my notes here and uh, send an email out to the board to see if if there are, are are things that are you know we can we can parse out and people can take a look at and report back. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to sort of reiterate again the the notion of getting feedback and doing things to consult with the public and and figure out how we can be better. Uh, but that leads to another thing, and that is this was a good thing to have, and we ought to have the, we, it ought to be in our work plan over the course of a year to either semi annually or annually do this sort of thing because otherwise it's so it's so easy to let it all slide until suddenly you've got a bunch of adverse events that make you say, oops, I better do something. And you know, having something where you have to have that meeting every December or whenever it is means that you have something other than a disaster that leads you to have the meeting and that's always good. Well, I think to that too, uh, John, glad for your, your reminder about sort of the, the, the post user survey. Um, if there's somebody who would like to take a stab at what kinds of questions we might want to, uh, to send out is to you know, people who have appeared in front of the board within the past half year um, to sort of get some information about their experiences and what they, what might be helpful to, um, for us to consider going forward. Mr. Chairman, I'll take a stab at that. Well, thank you, Mr. Mills. Excellent. Chairman, I, it seems one thing that we might do is, you know, again, this is sort of maybe up to Mr. Mills, and, but I have this feeling that there's somebody that the town manager would know about that is on our payroll who does <laughs> things like that. Cause I think that this kind of thing is done in some other context. I may be wrong about that. It's it, but, I, but it, it's worth a, a phone call to see if they, we have anybody on staff who can provide assistance with doing it. Cause it, it's tricky because if you ask too many questions, nobody will answer it. But if you don't ask, enough questions then you won't get the answer the information you need so you kind of ha have to find the right way to 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 deal with that yeah i know because i'm trying to think like who in town sends out surveys that's like you know, the planning department sends surveys and envision arlington sends surveys i'm not sure who else does yeah i don't know you might look at the economic development people that they're in the planning department mm -hmm. also. So that might do it. I, I might be wrong and just, th I mean, it's worth, it's worth a try. It's only a phone call. <laughs> and if nobody has any information to give us, then we just have to do it on our own. Um, Mr. Chairman, can I offer? Um, Mr. Moore. Um, would it be possible then that, that idea of an exit interview, I think that was your idea, Mr. Hanlon, is a good idea because the only folks that are going to have useful input for you are the ones that have gone through this process. 
So if you could kind of require that, you know, they give you feedback, <laughs> require that, but require that they have something to say, like other than good process, great time, but rather, you know, th this was good. Uh, one suggestion I might have, maybe not let them leave the process without offering at least mm -hmm. one or two suggestions somehow. You know, you keep it light, but those are the folks that are going to have input for you. Right. Ones of all the different kinds from developers right on down to someone doing their own dormer. They're the ones you want to hear from. Yep, absolutely. That's right. So make it a requirement for them to do that before they exit the process. Maybe. I, I, you know. I don't know that we can make them, but probably, <laughs> but you could always encourage it. Yeah, right. And if there's anything, the last question is, if there's anything that, that really pissed you off, what is it? And that, <laughs> that'll get a response. Every <laughs> we'll have Kevin call them individually. That'll be <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're in a good place on this stuff. Um, we have some, some things sort of assigned out so we'll, we can touch base on this, um, you know, in a couple of sessions, a couple of sessions after now and sort of get a sense for, for where we are and where we might want to put some more focus. Um, so we'll, I will move on from those. Um, so next, uh, to sort of preparing for the end of the meeting here, um, we have a meeting. So we are trying to really sort of meet consistently now on the second and fourth of Tuesday, unless there's really nothing to do. Um, so Tuesday, May 10th is, would be our next meeting. And currently the only thing we would really be doing on that date is approving the decision for River Street. And so if people are not opposed, I would like to, you know, essentially have the shortest meeting we've ever had um, to just do that so we can keep that, that process moving along. And then on the 24th, there are currently four cases that are queued up for that date. Um, that will be our schedule moving forward. Um, is there anything else on the board for this evening? Seeing none, I'm just reviewing our agenda here, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Done all that stuff. Perfect. Well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee. Um, Jennifer Zeus and uh, Mustafa Vergalo for their assistance um, and presentations at this evening. Please note that the board's recording the meeting to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. So to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont is already left us this evening. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Belly. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night.